Can we start, Susie? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. So welcome back to the um, core learning in inherited credit conditions um, education session. Um, we're going to start the afternoon off with um, our cardiac conditions in adult metabolic disease and no other then Professor Jerry Carr White will be doing this presentation. Um, he's consultant cardiologist at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital and um, an, an expert in um, ICCs, but also in heart failure. Thank you, Jerry. Great, thanks, Tutti. Um, real pleasure to, to be here talking to you all. So I'm going to try and cover inherited metabolic disease and mitochondrial in about 15 minutes. So it's a bit of a whiz through and some, some key messages. Mm -hmm. OK, so, so everyone thinks these diseases are really rare, but when you put them all together, they're, they're really not. So they account for about 5% of all cardiomyopathies. And if you get rid of the sort of idiopathic ones, it's up to about 15%. So as a group, they're, they're far more common than we realise. And, and I think you really have to look out for them to, to pick them up. And for the inherited metabolic rather than mitochondrial diseases, they tend to be a single enzymatic deficiency in a particular pathway. And so you get accumulation of substrates and deficiency of the end products, and it's that combination that, that gives you the toxicity. Normally present with hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy, but can have pre-excitation and arrhythmias as well. And I think one of the key things is, is they can deteriorate very quickly. So you can see people with preserved function doing really well that within a couple of days, can develop these toxic substrates and actually get quite appalling heart failure very, very quickly. So, so often you have to bring them in and, and correct the abnormalities ever so quickly to, to get them better. Diet and nutrition is, is often incredibly important with these patients and they're multi-system disorders. So you do need a, a combined approach and ideally at a clinic where you have multiple clinicians seeing them. So if we just go through the inherited, the different inherited metabolic disorders. So the first lot is amino acid and organic acid metabolism. And, and these we tend not to see in adults. They tend to present in children, normally with oftentimes quite bad dilated cardiomyopathy. And I won't spend much more time on those. You then have the disorders of fatty acid metabolism. So you have the carnitine transport defects and you have the fatty acid oxidation defects. And these long chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, we, we've seen a few really tricky cases of these over the last month. And that's because some of the proprietary formulas for, for their nutrition have been stopped being made. So we've had a, a few sort of catastrophic presentations of these in the last few months. And what, what this is, is it's an enzyme which catalyzes the initial step of mitochondrial beta oxidation of these long chain fatty acids. And you get these three phenotypes. So you get a severe early onset phenotype. You then get the hepatic or hypoketotic, hypoglycemic phenotype. And then the one we tend to see more in adults is this later onset episodic myopathic form. So they get this intermittent rhabdomyolysis provoked by exercise. They get muscle cramps, pain, exercise intolerance. And when the nutrition goes wrong, their, their heart failure can decompensate really very quickly. You diagnose it on this specific pattern of abnormal acyl carnitine levels and then the appropriate genetic testing. If you just get one variant in the gene, though, you often need to use cultured fibroblasts and lymphocytes to make a definitive diagnosis. And then if you look at the treatment, there's a daily treatment, which is this low fat formula or low long chain fat, high medium chain triglyceride food, and then a, a whole variety of different supplements. They should avoid severe exercise and the, the treatment of the cardiac manifestations is as it would for, for any cardiac problem. There's then the emergency outpatient treatment where you get this high carbohydrate feeds and then acute inpatient treatment where you have the IV dextrose and you avoid the lipids and carnitine. OK, so if we move on to disorders of glycogen metabolism, so I've listed them here. So we look after a few glycogen storage disease type three patients and they can have really quite a nasty early onset hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they have a lot of scar on their MRI. We've only just started realising that in the last few years, I think. So we're starting to 
to move the threshold for ICDs in these patients. So there's a there's not many across the world. So there's been a whole lot of different discussions about these patients. And I think the degree of scar in them is making us put in more ICDs than we used to before we were MRIing them all. And then if we go on to the ones we tend to see a little bit more often in the, the adult clinics. So Danon disease, so it's X-linked, X-linked skeletal and cardiac muscle disorder. And the classic triad is cardiomyopathy, skeletal myopathy and intellectual disability in boys and females will present 10 or 15 years later. And in terms of the cardiomyopathy, you often get really quite extreme hypertrophy and it can then move on to a dilated phase in a small minority. And you get pre-excitation quite commonly, so in up to 70% of males. You get mild learning difficulties and you get ocular disease, raised CK and LFTs. And when you're thinking of the differential diagnosis, a normal acid maltase is important with them. And then the, the other similar disease we think about is PRKAG2. So again, that should be considered if you get a, a positive family history. This is autosomal dominant, tend to present fairly young. In terms of the electrical abnormalities, they're bradycardic, they have short PR delta wave, they have bundle branch block, frequently get heart block. They get concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. They get chronotropic incompetence is quite characteristic of this group. You can see accessory pathways relatively commonly. And you get epilepsy, myalgia, early onset hypertension. So, so if you look at this table on the right, just to try and differentiate sarcomeric hokum, PRKAG and LAMP2, you can see LAMP2 tends to present sort of much earlier than the other two. And if you look at the pre-excitation, much more common in PRKAG2 and LAMP2. And if you look at the hypertrophy, much more extreme in the LAMP2, we're relatively mild at times in the PRKAG2. So that's a way to try and differentiate those three. If we think about glycoprotein metabolism, there's lysosomal storage diseases, and there's glycogen storage disease type 2, which is Pompe disease. Classically, this is progressive hypertonia, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hepatomegaly, and respiratory insufficiency, leading to death very early on without enzyme replacement. But there is a late onset form where you get this slowly progressive proximal muscle weakness, respiratory difficulties, and a bit like the LAMP2, you get really marked severe left ventricular hypertrophy, both on your ECG and on your echo, as you can see in the pictures here. OK, these are disorders of mucopolysaccharide metabolism. Um, tend not to see a great deal of these, and they tend to present to the, the paediatricians rather than the adult team. And if you look at disorders of glycosphingolipid metabolism, so there's Gaucher disease, and then this slide is all about Fabry's disease. So maybe up to 5% of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is in fact Fabry's disease, and there's effective treatments for it now. So it's important to pick it up. And in hemizygous males, you know, typically present during late childhood, you get this acroparesthesia, this sort of tingling, numbness, weird pins and needles. You get a lot of GI symptoms. A lack of sweating is, is a very, very important symptom to pick up, and it's quite characteristic. Then as they get older, the accumulation causes renal failure strokes. You get progressive, um, you get progressive valve disease, you get slightly premature coronary disease. Um, female carriers can be affected, tends to be quite mild. And then you get this later presentation, predominantly cardiac variant with heart failure, arrhythmias, valve disease and angina. So, so think about it when you have concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, kidney problem stroke, you get this bathing trunk angiokeratoma, you get eye issues. Again, you can get heart block, pre-excitation. And on the MRI, you, you tend to get a bit of postural scar and low T1s are a very characteristic sign of Fabry. So always look at the T1 values when you're MRIing someone with concentric hypertrophy. And you can't non farva to sun transmission, cryptogenic stroke, severe kidney failure, again, all, all red flags. OK, that was a, a whistle stop in 10 minutes through um, inherited metabolic disease. But the, the key, I think, is to, to work with the metabolic team. They, they know far more about it than, than we do. So having the, the joined up clinics is definitely the way forward there. So, so mitochondrial disorders, 
So mitochondria, 90% of our ATP is generated in mitochondria. There's 10 to thousands per cell. And, and the numbers are highest in the brain, skeletal muscle, heart, kidney, liver. So that's where you see the predominant issues with, with mitochondrial disease. And there's about 50 known mutations if you have mitochondrial DNA. And we think there's a lot more that are unknown. And what are they? So they're a, a heterogeneous group of systemic disorders, sporadic or inherited mutations in mitochondrial DNA, but also nuclear DNA. So the nuclear mutations are, are probably less well characterized, less characteristic phenotypes, but there's probably more of them. So, so it can be both. And what they do is cause impairment of oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and that's how they and they affect the electron transport chain and all the different bits of that. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is probably the dominant pattern, often quite mild hypertrophy with preserved function, but they can present with really quite severe heart failure and dilated cardiomyopathy. And the diagnosis is often challenged because of the wide clinical and genetic heterogeneity. So you do need a, a multi-system approach. And just a few sort of principles around mitochondrial disease. So, so homoplasmy is when the same mitochondrial genome is in all tissues of the body. We tend not to see that with the disorders we look after. So you have heteroplasmy. So you have more than one mitochondrial genome in a body and they can have various ratios in different tissues. So if you look at this, this picture that's up here, you can see you have this replicative segregation and you have this threshold level. So you have a presence of both mutated and normal DNA and you reach a, a threshold at which you present with, with clear symptoms and signs and that depends on the tissue distribution of the mutated DNA and the vulnerability of each tissue to impaired oxidative metabolism and so you will see different presentations in different organs in different people in the same family so it's, it's quite a widespread and the clinical expression varies enormously. So this is what the mitochondrial DNA looks like. So there's two to 10 copies per organelle. And there's the different RNAs I've said there. So 13 of the 90 electron transport chain proteins encoded by mitochondrial DNA and the other 77 by nuclear DNA. And that's where you get the, the interplay between these two different systems. And if you look at the sort of electron chain transport, you can see the different complexes on that table on the right and the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA mutations that affect the different parts of the complex. And when you're thinking of the red flags to think of mitochondrial disorders, they tend to present from the cardiac side with concentric hypertrophy in their 30s or 40s and the more significant dilated cardiomyopathy often comes a bit later. We've mentioned the threshold effect and the, the red flags are pre-excitation, heart block, ophthalmoplegia, neuropathy, seizures, deafness, diabetes, develop, developmental delay. They're, they're the sort of real red flags to look out for. Often have a raised CK, often have a dramatically low VO2 max and anaerobic threshold when you do a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Sometimes need a muscle biopsy. And again, the acute episodes can be quite dramatic in these conditions. Here are the sort of multi-system things to look out for. Lots of neurological things that present with mitochondrial problems. There's the visual side, the ophthalmoplegia, ptosis is quite common, optic atrophy, retinitis pigmentosa, peripheral neuropathy, myopathy, and then quite frequently, particularly in the MELAS patients, we see a lot of gastrointestinal problems. And given the importance of nutrition, that often gives us real problems in a bit of a vicious cycle. Renal tubular problems, and then cardiac wise, it's cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, conduction defects. Diabetes, very common. Um, pancreatic failure, thyroid problems. I'm not going to go through the details of the slide, but this is just the sort of diagnostic criteria and what we use to try and make the diagnosis. So there's the, the clinical side, typical mitochondrial symptoms and signs. Um, and then there's the appropriate genetic testing. And again, it's only in the minority we get a clear pathogenic variant. When you're unsure, there's histology, so muscle uh, muscle fibres, so ragged red fibres in a skeletal muscle biopsy. There's enzyme enzyme tests looking at the percent of Cox negative fibres in a patient. 
as functional, looking at fibroblast ATP synthesis rates, molecular, again, looking at different mutations. So it's a whole combined approach, often quite difficult to get a clear diagnosis. And the, the way to think about it is if you've got a clear characteristic syndrome like MELAS or MRF, then you can test for the appropriate genetic mutation we know about. But if it's non-specific, as you often see with some of the nuclear mutations, you go down the biochemistry, molecular genetics, histochemistry and muscle biopsy. It's often the way you get a diagnosis with those. And once you've got a definitive diagnosis, you need to assess the phenotype as it's often quite subtle and very varied. So you need the ophthalmology, audiology, cardiac, neurophysiology, cranial imaging. And these are the common syndromes we see. So it's a bath tends to present very young and can be lethal at a very young age. Um, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, I can certainly see arrhythmias with that. Lay syndrome can be nuclear or, or mitochondrial inheritance and tends to present predominantly with arrhythmias, but the maternal one perhaps slightly more with cardiomyopathy. Can say often gives you arrhythmias. Melas is the, I think the one we see most commonly and you can get hypertrophy, hypertrabeculation and dilated cardiomyopathy. And then when, when there was a meta-analysis quite recently. Again, the numbers in all the studies on mitochondrial patients is, is pretty low, but they suggested more severe phenotype in MELAS and myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibres, particularly with the characteristic mutations. So just last minute or so, just going to go through MELAS because it's the one I think we see most commonly. So mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes because the, the, the MRI imaging of the brain, it, it's non-vascular distribution of the abnormalities. So present between 2 and 40, lactic acidemia very common, biopsies show these ragged red fibres and diagnosis is the clinical criteria and the typical pathogenic variants and 80% and of them will carry this 3243 AG variant but there are other ones that we pick up. And the treatment, so when they have their stroke-like episodes, it's intravenous arginine and then oral afterwards. Coenzyme Q10 probably is beneficial, carnitine, creatine in some individuals, cochlear implants, anticonvulsants. The, the cardiac side of things, you just treat as you would any hypertrophic dilated cardiomyopathy. There's no different threshold to when you think about drugs or devices. Um, manage the diabetes. And then for the secondary complications, so, so the febrile illness will trigger exacerbation, so they must have all their vaccinations. Uh, surveillance, that we, we don't really know how often to, to see them, certainly from a cardiac side of things. We, we default to, to every year, but it probably doesn't need to be that often if there's clear red flags for, for when they come back to, to tell you there's issues. Um, quite important that they avoid various toxins that can make things worse quite quickly. So aminoglycoside antibiotics, cigarettes and alcohol, valproic acid, metformin. Um, so should avoid all of those. And pregnancy management, they, they should be monitored particularly for the diabetes and respiratory problems. So when you're doing the genetic counselling, so it's MELAS is mitochondrial inherited. So the father of a proband um, is not at risk. The mother of a PO band usually has the pathogenic variant, but may or may not have symptoms. So a man with a pathogenic variant can't transmit to any offspring, but a woman will transmit it to, to, to all of her offspring. But when you're talking them through, you know, the, the functional effects of having a mutation, it's so variable. You've got to be really clear that within the same family, there's multiple variabilities and within the same patient, within each organ, it can be very variable. So important to, to explain that when you're counselling them. OK, so, so in conclusion, so inherited metabolic mitochondrial disorder is much more common than people realise. There are multi-system disorder, needs a team approach. You need a specialist unit and clinic because there's not many of them, but a, as a group, there's reasonable numbers. Nutrition, very important, and they can decompensate very dramatically. So, so Tuti, I'm just going to spend two minutes on something else. Is that all right? OK, Jerry. Rachel Bastinian, if, can we take my slides down or do I have to do that? How do I do that? Yeah, you have to unshare, uh, stop sharing. Yeah, so there we go.
Great, great show. Can, can you turn your camera on? Hello, Rachel. So Hi, I, I guess I guess the, the click program has sort of been gone through the, um, the the South London ODN, and I just wanted to spend two minutes to to thank Rachel from all of us because it's been phenomenally successful, and it's just I'm just going to give you a few little facts. So. 2,300 registrants, 1,200 feedback forms, 700 certificates. We've had views from all over the world and actually when you map it, it's been incredible where they've been logging in from. So, so the microsite on our ODN website gets more hits than the main ODN homepage. So 3,000 unique users, uh, 3,100 new users and the YouTube stats. So 2,600 views. 15,000 impressions, which I don't know what that means, Rachel, but that does sound very impressive. So so really you've put together a, a world class program. So a big thank you from all of us. You've done a fantastic job. Just wanted to finish on that too, if I may. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, and thank you. Um, a, a big thank you also to Andrea Marlowe, who's, who's been my partner in crime for uh, the, the click sessions and it wouldn't have been possible without her. But of course, massive thank you to you, to all our other speakers and our co-chairs to, to making this happen. And here's to click 2023, I hope. So thanks very much. Thanks for that lovely message, Jerry.